Welcome to the course on plasma physics and applications. Today we will discuss the heating of the plasma to thermonuclear temperatures, that is temperatures that are needed for a fusion reactor to work. We will start by discussing ohmic heating, that is the heating of the plasma by an electrical current, and the limitations of, of that method. Therefore we will illustrate the need for additional plasma heating, additional meaning in addition uh, to the ohmic heating method. We will then focus on the first of the systems that we will consider for a reactor, the neutral beam injection. We will uh, explore the processes that, that take place as the beam is injected into the plasma, the components that are needed for the beam injection system, the neutralization of the beam before it is injected into the tokamak plasma, and the requirements that the beam needs to satisfy in order to be usable on large devices, for example, on the ether tokamak. We will illustrate the example of uh, the NBI system that is operational on JET, and we'll say a few words about the design of the NBI system for ITER. Finally, we will discuss the advantages and disadvantages of the NBI heating method for a reactor in the future. First, I'd like to remind ourselves that we need the power to initiate the plasma discharge, that is to ionize the gas that we inject into the tokamak. That's uh, fairly intuitive. On the other hand, what may be a little bit less intuitive, that we also need a certain power level to overcome what's called the radiation barrier. The radiation barrier comes about because the emission from uh, light impurities that are present into our gas and then into the plasma has a maximum for temperatures that are typically of a few tens of uh, EV, typically below 100 EV. And if the power that you inject in the, into the tokamak is lower than a certain critical value that's associated with this uh, impurity emission, then the temperature will never be able to exceed this value uh, that corresponds to the maximum of the emission of the light by impurities. And typically for a mid-sized tokamak, we have taken the example here of a, say a two meter major radius tokamak, you need uh, something like uh, a megawatt to fully ionize your gas to, to make the plasma. And you need more than that, something like uh, four or five megawatts to overcome this radiation barrier. It's only after that uh, level, once the radiation barrier is overcome, that we manage to keep increasing the temperature towards, of course, uh, values that are of interest for thermonuclear reactions and the uh, efficiency and the, therefore the uh, slope of the curve of the increase of temperature with the additional uh, power injected into the plasma, of course, depends on the levels of transport the plasma has, and so on. As you remember, the concept of tokamak is based not only on external fields that are produced by coils, mainly in the toroidal direction, but also by transformer action, that is, by swinging the flux produced by a primary coil of the transformer and therefore inducing an electromotive force in the plasma ring which uh, therefore provides a drive for a current through the plasma. Now as the resistivity, as we have learned in the first part of this course, is proportional to three t uh, the temperature to the minus three halves, the profile of the current that will be driven into the plasma will be strictly related to the profile of the temperature of the plasma itself. So that's the first observation. But the second observation is even more important, and that is that the ohmic power, let's call it p-ohmic, that I can dissipate into the plasma, and in this case I'd like to heat the plasma by passing current through it, is obviously proportional, or in fact equal, to the loop voltage that's uh, generated by this uh, transformer action times the current that flows into the plasma, IP. That's uh, the resistance of the whole plasma times the current square, and that is proportional to the resistivity times the current density square. So we have a direct dependence on the resistivity, therefore we have a dependence upon T to the minus 3 so if on one hand this current is efficient in producing the uh, poloidal field that needs to complete 
the uh, magnetic field structure for trapping the plasma into the tokamak, this current is progressively more and more inefficient at heating the plasma as we increase its temperature. We can then uh, therefore discuss why we need specifically additional plasma heating. I like to illustrate that in a semi-quantitative way in a plot in which I represent vertically the power corresponding to different channels in the plasma, say in megawatt. Say we take a logarithmic scale, say 1, 10, 100 and 1000 megawatt. And I represent that as a function of the temperature, say in kilo electron volt, of the plasma. So we have just learned that the ohmic heating will uh, go down with the power of temperature of the, to the three halves. So say it will take a curve of this kind. I can also represent the horizontal axis uh, with a logarithmic scale. This is 10 kV and then say all the way to the right we have 100 kV. So the ohmic heating power goes down to very low level before the plasma can reach temperature of the order of 10 kV. The example taken here semi-quantitatively is an example of a say one meter uh, major radius tokamak. Um, so this is the ohmic power going down with the power of T temperature. Now in a, a reactor we will count at some point on the power provided by the heating uh, due to the alpha particles that are issued by fusion um, reactions themselves and that will be coming ab about when the plasma temperature will be larger than a few kV so say it will be something like that so this is the alpha heating power and if we had no losses it would be no problem because it will use the ohmic power all the way to the point which will be around few kV where the alpha particle heating will uh, take over. But we of course do have losses. We have losses in the form of radiation, like bremsstrahlung, but also losses in the form of a convective and conduction uh, transport of ion and electron heat, in particular of ion heat. So let's put uh, even the lowest possible loss power that we can have, that of bremsstrahlung, and in all the circumstances we can think about in practice, this Bremsstrahlung level will be higher than the level at which the curve of ohmic power crosses that of the alpha heating power. So even without invoking any uh, transport from conduction and convection, which, which, which you actually know it will dominate over Bremsstrahlung, so I can even perhaps just uh, trace it something like that, let's say just call it heat transport. Even if we reduce that to minimum level below Bremsstrahlung level, which would be in practice very very difficult to do, we will have a gap here that is a region where we will not be able to connect the ohmic power to the alpha heating power. In other words, we have a shortfall of power in this region which is in the region of a few kV of temperature where we need to do something. And do something means heating the plasma by other means than ohmic power. So this gap needs to be filled by what we call additional heating. So let's briefly review what options do we have for heating the plasma in addition to passing an electric current through it which is what we refer to as ohmic heating. We may heat the plasma by injecting a beam or very energetic neutral particles that will become ions once they are entering the plasma. And these particles will transfer their energy and momentum by collisions to the plasma particles, therefore will heat the plasma. Or we can inject waves into the plasma. We have seen in previous parts of this course there are several possibilities for 
waves to exist in plasma at different uh, frequency ranges. We can inject waves that resonate with, uh, for example, the electron species, that would be high frequency, or we can inject waves that resonate with the ion species, that would be lower frequency. And in both cases, we can transfer power from these waves that we can uh, inject using um, transmission lines and antennas that are close to the plasma, to the plasma, therefore heating it to thermonuclear temperatures. Today, as we said, we will focus on the first of these methods, that is the neutral beam heating. So the idea here is to inject somehow energetic ions into the plasma that would give the energy to cold the plasma particles. By energetic ions, we mean ions that don't belong to the thermal distribution of the plasma itself, so that should be uh, much more uh, energetic than the energy corresponding to the plasma temperature. But how can we inject a beam of ions into a very complicated magnetic field that we have actually prepared and set up in order to avoid the leaking of plasma out from our confinement volume? Such field will, of course, prevent the penetration of ions from outside as it uh, prevents the escape of ions from inside. So here's the idea. We can use neutral particles at high energy to get into the plasma, because neutral particles, of course, don't feel the influence of the magnetic field that provides confinement, and then let them be ionized by the plasma itself. So once they are in the plasma, they progressively become a beam of energetic ions, which then in turn can transfer by uh, Coulomb collisions their energy to the plasma uh, ions and electrons. That's the idea of the neutral beam. What are the main components in a neutral beam? In order to illustrate them, I've taken the... Um, very uh, simplified, of course, layout of the neutral beam injector that we use on the jet tokamak. Let's run through the different uh, elements here. We have, of course, a, a source of gas that's injected into the source of ions for uh, the beam. In this example, and in the, in the injector in the jet, the ions are positive ions that are created by a, an arc uh, discharge. There are other options, in fact, um, for example, one can use uh, RF waves to create um, the plasma from which we extract the ions for the injector. We'll discuss that option a little bit later. Then once we have uh, a source of ions, we need to extract uh, the ions and accelerate them. But it's actually very or relatively easy to accelerate ions or charged particles in general because they can be uh, accelerated by a set of uh, electrostatic uh, grids that um, provide them with the energy corresponding to the uh, potential difference that we apply to the grids. So now we have a beam of uh, ions that are highly energetic. What we need to do is to neutralize them before they are injected into the tokamak system. As we said, the ions would not be able to <coughs> penetrate into the tokamak volume if they are uh, still ions, that is, if they are still charged. So we need a chamber that uh, neutralizes them. We can inject a gas um, to do that and uh, uh, attach an electron onto the ions in this case because we were starting with positive ions. Uh, of course, this process will not be 100% efficient, so what we need to do is to get rid of the ions that remain ions by deflecting them using a magnet and by collecting them on an ion dump, which will need to be, of course, actively cooled. And then in the presence of a very high vacuum, pass this beam of uh, particles that are still energetic because they were accelerated once they were ions, but they're now neutral, to finally the plasma. We focus now uh, on what happens in the plasma once the neutral particles at high energy are injected into it. So we focus on the processes that occur as the beam arrives into the plasma. We have essentially three possible processes. First, we can have ionization by ions. I take the example of a hydrogen beam, so the notation is a little simpler. So I have the beam hydrogen uh, particle, that's a neutral, which encounters a, uh, an ion, a positive ion in the plasma, and gets ionized. So, of course, there will be the creation of a positive ion in the beam and of a free electron. We can also have ionization by electrons. I still have my uh, 
beam particle, which in this case encounters an electron and gets ionized by it, with of course the release of an additional electron. So we have two electrons plus an ionized beam particle. Or we can have a third process, which we call a charge exchange. So here there is no direct ionization, but there's an exchange of charge between the neutral beam particle and the plasma ion, so that I have now an ionized uh, neutral beam uh, particle and a neutral particle that uh, was the particle uh, that was an ion in the plasma. So, of course, these are binary processes that we can treat as a collisional process, that is, represent them uh, in terms of their uh, effective cross-section. And the effective cross-section will tell us which uh, process is the most likely to occur, depending on the parameters, for example, depending on the energy of the beam. I notice that the charge exchange process will also lead to the emission of light, and the emission of light will contain the signatures of the uh, properties of the ion motion in the plasma, namely ordered flows in terms of uh, the Doppler shift of the line emission, or the thermal motion in terms of the uh, Doppler broadening of the line emission. So the charge exchange process is used also to diagnose both ion velocities and ion temperatures. Let's represent qualitatively the cross sections for the different processes. And I do that as a function of the, say, the beam energy. And let's just take as a reference the uh, a deuterium beam. I consider a scale in kilo electron volt, say 10, 100, and 1000. That is 1 MeV in a logarithmic scale. And on the vertical scale, I consider the cross section in square meters. Again, on the log scale, 10 to the minus 21, say 10 to the minus 20 halfway, and 10 to the minus 19 at the top. So let's start by the process that has the largest cross-section at low energy, and that is the uh, charge exchange process. And qualitatively, it has a cross-section that goes down with energy in this way. So this is a the charge exchange process that we represent with the cross-section called sigma CH. At high energy, we have the ionization by ions that dominate. And again, in a qualitative way, I would draw the cross-section for that in green. Let's call that sigma I. What about the ionization by electrons? That, in general, is actually smaller or has a smaller cross-section than, than the other two and of course its value uh, will depend on the uh, electron temperature say I for example for the case of 10 kV say I take temperature for the electron of 10 kV and this is the cross-section for electron um, ionization or better for ionization of the beam by electrons. So we see that at low energies the process is dominated by charge exchange, whereas at high energy the dominant process is ionization by ions. Now we are ready to represent what happens as the beam penetrates into the plasma. We know what processes are happening, we even know which ones are dominating depending on the energy. So what's the evolution of the beam intensity? I can write the equation that describes that as the variation of the intensity of the beam with distance. And I write that in a one-dimensional way to keep things simple. It is equal to minus the density of the targets, that is the density of the plasma, times the cross-section for charge exchange section for ionization by ions, and the term that corresponds to ionization by electrons. Let's write that as sigma VVE, integrator of the plasma distribution divided by the beam velocity. Of course, 
times the intensity. I just noticed that the form for the third term is different because the dominant velocity in the collisional processes between the beam ions and the electrons is actually that of the electrons. What is the solution to this kind of equation? It is of course an exponential. So let's say I0 is the initial intensity. And the exponential is a function of the penetration distance into the plasma and is parameterized by a parameter lambda that we can call the penetration depth. So what we have is something like that. As we say, x is the distance into the plasma. The intensity will go down exponentially as we go into the plasma. As the point at which the intensity is 1 over e times the initial intensity corresponds to our penetration depth. So what is the lambda determined by? We say that low energy charge exchange dominates. So the cross-section for charge exchange is much larger both than sigma i and then the equivalent term for the interaction with electrons. Therefore the penetration depth in this case would be 1 over the density of the plasma times the charge exchange cross-section. A high energy, we have the situation in which it is the ionization cross-section for ions to ionize the beams that dominates. Therefore, the penetration depth will be given by 1 over the plasma density times the ionization for the ions, the uh, ionization uh, cross-section for the ions onto the beam particles. I can now represent in a plot as a function of the beam energy the penetration distance and the fraction of uh, the beam that remains neutral. Say we go from 0 to 1 and uh, we have uh, something like uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, say 100 and 300 kV of energy for the beam. So my penetration distance will go higher and higher as I will increase the beam energy. Say I represent this in meters, so it will go uh, to macroscopic distances such as a meter or a few meters as I increase the energy of the beam above a few hundred kV. Now I have a quality to represent this curve with a knee, and that knee corresponds to the uh, energy at which I have a transition between a process that's dominated by charge exchange and a process that's dominated by ionization by ions. In this example, I uh, consider uh, qualitative in a deuterium beam in a deuterium uh, plasma. Together with the penetration distance increasing with the beam energy, of course, we have the opposite effect for the uh, neutral fraction, that is the fraction of the beam that remains neutral, that would go from uh, uh, almost 100% to almost 0% as we go higher and higher in uh, energy. So one key point here is that for plasma that are large, so we need to go to uh, a meter or more into the plasma with our beam, we need to go to hundreds of kV or more for the energy of the beam. So for large plasma, we need large beam energies. The other point that we need to be careful about is that on the opposite, for small plasma, we need and we must use low beam energies, otherwise the uh, beam will not be absorbed by the plasma uh, at all and we will pass through the plasma and impinge on the walls on the other side of the injection um, port and therefore potentially damage the machine. So that's so-called shine-through. And the shine-through determines uh, the minimum plasma density at which we can operate a beam. So having established what we need for the beam, let's go back a little bit of, to a, a key point uh, in the 
beam system. That is the neutralization of the beam before is actually injected into the machine, into the tokamak. And if we represent the efficiency which, with which we neutralize the beam as a function of the energy of the beam, here it's in uh, terms of keV per atomic mass unit, we notice that this efficiency, which is uh, decent at low energy, say the energy of the order 10 or, or 20 or 30 keV for hydrogen, for example, it goes down very significantly as we go towards energies um, that are in the order of 100 keV. It goes down for the case of positive ions. That's the case that we have illustrated in the example taken from JET. And this is the same or similar for the different uh, um, species that we have in a beam. So there's no way we can have a beam of several hundreds of keV, hydrogen or deuterium, with positive ions. The reason being that the neutralization efficiency will be very, very, very small. What can we do then? Well, we can look at the blue curve, which corresponds to the neutralization efficiency for beams made with negative ions, and notice that although that does go down some, it remains at levels that are still uh, tolerable and, com and compatible with the operation of reactors, say at least 60%. Like, uh, all the way up to, um, say, an MeV for uh, hydrogen here. So all the way up to the energy that we need in order for our beam to reach uh, penetration distances that are of the order of a few meters, that is the size of it and the future reactors that we are foreseen to have. And the reason for that is that um, the neutralization for the negative ions is much easier because of the low affinity, say uh, less than an EV, typically 0.75 EV, of the additional electron that's attached to the hydrogen. So because we need large penetration depth, and that implies large energy, for large and dense plasmas we therefore need and must use negative ion beams. So what happens in the plasma once we manage to get the beam into it? Well, the plasma, and that's of course the reason why we do it, will be heated. Let's look at that a little bit more into the details. So where is the heating from? The heating comes from the collisions between fast ions from the beam and plasma electrodes or ions. You have seen in the first part of the course, how one treats collisions, particular Coulomb collisions. These are the ones we are considering now. So the energy transfer is, of course, what we want because that's corresponding to plasma heating. So how does that work? We can represent this heating uh, in terms of uh, power. And that would be equal to minus the energy deposited by the beam divided by a typical time over which the particle will be slowing down. These are the suprathermal particles injected by the beam. We call that the slowing down time. Times two terms, one corresponding to the heating of the electrons, and the second one corresponding to the heating of the ions. So this is the part going to the ions. The critical energy, which we refer to as E crit in this formula, is given by about 15 times the electron temperature times the mass of the beam divided by the electron density times the sum or different species of the density zi squared divided by the mass of the uh, species and in most cases this is not that different from taking something like uh, 15 times Te and that critical density, uh, sorry, critical energy this critical energy is the energy at which the heating of the electrons is equivalent to that of the ions so we can have uh, say two situations if the beam energy it's much larger than the critical energy. The heating will be mainly on electrons. 
Whereas if we have the opposite situation, the heating will be mainly of the ions. Now, this will be the case of future large devices, whereas this is the case of present devices. So we have seen that the heating of the plasma comes about because we inject neutrons at high energy that become energetic ions. And typically, at present, we inject energies of the order 100 kV. In ether, we will inject energy of the order of 1 MeV. The injection geometry is also an important parameter because that determines the character of the orbits of these energetic ions. If the injection is uh, tangential, that is as parallel as possible to the toroidal uh, direction, we will start with mostly passing orbits, that is orbits, as you can see in this movie, that are circulating around uh, the tokamak. But, of course, there will be some collisions, and collisions scatter the circulating particles into trap orbits, as you can see um, not only from the representation in real space on the left, but also from the representation in the velocity space on the right, where um, the um, ions are going from being uh, passing to being trapped by uh, collisional effects. This is a simulation in a realistic uh, uh, tokamak environment. So these are the characters of the orbits that we have for the uh, fast or energetic ions that are injected from NBI. That's important uh, not only for the heating and the uh, possibility of driving a non-inductive current in the plasma with, with these energetic particles, but also uh, for the potential interaction that these particles can have with plasma instabilities, as we will see in a, in a lecture in the future. I would like now to uh, uh, discuss briefly some concrete example of the NBI system. First of all, a system that exist, and in fact has been operational for a number of years, that of JET. JET has uh, different injectors, uh, 2 times 8, both for radial and tangential injection, at uh, uh, either 80 kV or 130 kV of energy. This is sufficient for uh, the beam to go into the core of the uh, JET plasma, and uh, at these energies, as uh, we said before, we don't require negative ion technology because the neutralization of positive ions is sufficiently efficient. The JET system has up to 34 megawatts of uh, total power in its recent upgrades. You can see the size of the system here, um, which is almost the same as that of the entire uh, tokamak. We can look at some of uh, uh, the details. Uh, here is the layout uh, of the system with the one injector with um, eight ion uh, sources uh, with the uh, insulators and seals that you can see in the layout here and you can see in the actual picture when the system was installed on the right. Um, each uh, of this tube has a so-called PINI extraction system, that's a plug-in neutral injector. It's a particular technology that was developed for, for JECT. We can uh, notice the electromagnetic uh, magnet to deflect the non-neutralized uh, ions that dump for those that in fact need to be um, evacuated because they're not neutral and the calorimeter that measures how much power we are actually injecting. On this side there would be a port that will lead us to uh, the uh, jet plasma. So this is the same picture as before but now uh, we are looking at that port that leads into the jet plasma. The port is uh, about 20 centimeters of uh, um, width for a height of about uh, 80 centimeters. Um, I just put the picture because uh, I'd like to uh, stress the point that the divergence of the beam is uh, an important parameter. We can't uh, impinge with the beam on the walls of the duct that takes us to the machine, both because we would damage the beam duct, but also because as soon as we deposit some power here, there will be significant outgassing from the um, beam wall interactions and the outgassing would block the propagation of the beam which will never uh, which would therefore never even reach the plasma volume. So we say that the beam works by generating uh, fast neutrals that become fast ions. Let's look at the evidence for the presence of these fast ions in a jet uh, 
uh, tokamak in a, in a few examples. In, in this case, we were actually injecting uh, some tritium into the uh, plasma using what we call uh, tritium NBI blips, so uh, small amounts of uh, tritium injected in the um, NBI system. And what we can do in this case is to measure the profiles of emission of the 14 MeV neutrons that are issued from uh, the DT reactions in the plasma. And by looking at the different lines of sight, both vertical and horizontal, we can tomographically reconstruct such emission profiles. And these are examples of that um, in the slightly different situations, so we won't go into any details, but they indicate uh, essentially where the fast ions are that were injected with the um, NBI. And uh, depending on the values of the current and the field in the plasma, which are varied here, and depending on the injection geometry in the first two cases on the left off axis, in the third case on axis, we can have slightly different profiles, or in fact significantly different profiles for the fast ions. So this confirms that we are actually injecting the fast ions into the plasma uh, where we think they are going. And um, in this case, let me now just say a few words about the NBI system that's being uh, designed and constructed for ITER. For heating and, uh, and current drive, we will have uh, two, at least initially two, tangential beams of negative ions, deuterium. Because of the size of ITER, these would be uh, in the MeV range for the energy. In fact, it would be uh, about 1 MeV, power of 33 megawatts, similar to that of jet, but for a much longer duration of a pulse, uh, 3,600 3, seconds. There would also be a third beam for diagnostic purposes. As we mentioned, the charge exchange process provides light that carries information about the ion temperature and about the ion uh, ordered velocity as well. Now, in order for that uh, process to dominate, remember that we need to have low energies. And therefore, we're injecting a beam. We will be injecting the beam in ITER at an energy of about 100 kV for diagnostic purposes. A beam that would have, of course, much lower power of the order of 3 megawatts. So here you see a layout of the uh, geometry of injection to, into the ITER tokamak seen from the top. And you see a, uh, a cat drawing of the three uh, systems, the two heating and current drive systems, uh, and the diagnostic beam into the ITER um, system. Now, the source uh, itself and the whole uh, beam accelerating system and the neutralization for ITER is a, a challenge, and uh, that's why it's still the subject of a significant R&D. There will be a very large surface uh, source, so with a couple of square meter uh, surface, which needs to produce very large current density, something like 300 ampere per square meter, with a high degree of uniformity across the surface. The concept uses so-called MAMUG um, that uh, extracts and accelerates the ions produced from this source multi-aperture, multi-grid accelerator system. Each step is 200 kilovolt. For the source itself, the uh, technology based on the radio frequency production of a plasma is uh, used as opposed to arc discharges. The choice uh, was based on the, uh, the reliability tests that have been made in different devices and also f on the need of having very low uh, maintenance requirements for um, the system once it's set operational. I just uh, highlight the fact that the negative ions are produced on the surfaces that are uh, covered with uh, cesium has been deposited on them. So low uh, work for function surfaces. And this is a surface production of plasma. Are we talking about, uh, of course, the uh, source uh, for the neutron beam? as opposed to the volume production we have seen in the, for example, in the jet system, uh, which is based on arc um, discharges. So this is the source, that's the acceleration stage. Uh, the neutralizer has quite a large volume, the residual ion dump, the calorimeter, so all the elements we have seen for jet, and of course there will be a valve 
and a set of bellows to connect uh, the whole system to um, the uh, tokamak. We are now ready to discuss uh, in a simple uh, way the possible advantages and disadvantages of the NBI heating system. We have seen that the interaction between the beam and the plasma is uh, fairly simple. There are th three essential uh, processes, uh, which in fact two dominate, uh, charge exchange and ionization by ions depending on the beam energy. The beam has the advantage that can be used to drive current non-inductively if it's directed uh, in a tangential uh, way. It has also the advantage that it can provide fueling of the plasma and in fact provide fueling on the plasma in the core of the plasma if the penetration depth is sufficient. And in fact these advantages are the reason why in present experiments I can say that the MBI represents uh, the workhorse uh, particularly for high performance operation. On the other hand there may be some cons. The deposition of the power is not that localized so it may be a little bit difficult to determine exactly uh, a localization for the heating or the current drive. The beam implies a relatively large beam duct as we have seen so there would be a relatively large opening in the chamber to make the beam pass through. That means that we have to uh, be careful about the leaking of neutrons out, out of the uh, thermonuclear region. And we also we're losing some surface that we could use for the blanket to breed tritium. The present technology of the beams has a relatively low electrical efficiency which of course in the future reactor is a problem and also even if we go for negative ions at large energies uh, at large energies we do have relatively small neutralization efficiency not much better than 60 percent. For these two uh, potential problems nevertheless there are significant R&D activities going around to improve the situation. Uh, I will just give you one example of them. This example is provided by the so-called uh, CIFOR concept in which uh, a new uh, technology for the plasma source. This technology is based on the resonant antenna that dries the plasma using helicon waves. In fact, helicon waves are uh, kind of waves that you have seen in uh, a previous course focused on the physics of plasma waves. We uh, can refer them also to them as uh, Whistler waves. I incidentally, this reminds you of the importance of plasma waves um, in uh, many, many applications. Once the plasma is produced in that source and extracted, um, or ions are extracted uh, from, from that source region, of course, they need to be neutralized, and we have seen that the neutral neutralization efficiency is one of the problems we're facing. But the idea in this uh, proposal is to use uh, light to increase efficiency by providing photoneutralization. Photoneutralization acts by photodetachment. So we have a negative ion, in this case the example of hydrogen, on which we inject a, a, a photon, and that provides uh, neutralization of that uh, negative ion and of course the emission of an electron which can then be deflected by the electromagnet later on. This is a concept that has been uh, investigated and may potentially provide both higher electrical efficiency for the plasma production in the source and higher neutralization efficiency using laser light. In summary we have seen that additional heating is required for thermonuclear reactors. By additional heating we mean heating that comes on top of the ohmic heating uh, which is a consequence of electrical current flowing into the plasma. The first system we have uh, investigated today was the neutral beam injector. A neutral beam provides a solution that has a number of advantages but some drawbacks, although some of the drawbacks can be overcome and that's why uh, we are doing uh, significant amounts of research and development on this issue. In the next two modules we'll investigate how we can heat the plasma using plasma waves of different frequencies.